Hello, everyone. Do you know the difference? Can you tell the difference between a monoid and glasses of beer? Anyone? <laughs> this talk is the answer. <laughs> That's a promise. All right, and in this talk, we also talk about taste in code and with a special dedication to Alberto Bandolini and his code gourmet. So I'm French, I'm sorry, so I have a terrible French accent, which is why every slide is subtitled, basically, for, for you. And, but uh, the good thing is that I can say gourmet correctly, at least. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I still define myself as a developer since a lot of time, uh, Sirius on Twitter, and uh, I live in Paris, and I came from Paris yesterday. I co-founded, I founded the software crafter community back in 2011. It still runs, now it's big, not as big as London, but it's a big one anyway. And I'm also the co-founder and associate and CTO of the company called Arola, and at Arola, we are fan of everything DD, <laughs> as you can see. All right, so back to the talk, and in this talk, there will be nothing spectacular, just very, very simple things. Trivial things that you can redo at home with no risk, and please try to redo. Also, this, this talk has been adapted. It used to be in an older format, now it's for the big screen. All right, so today we are at the Software Craftsmanship Conference in London to talk about software craft. And in software craft, one of the things we pay attention to is to select the right techniques to build quality software. So we love and we use TDD in our toolbox. We have TDD skills. We need functional programming skills, functional programming skills. We need domain-driven design skills. We need object-oriented programming skills, yes. We still need that. It's not gone. <laughs> we still need these skills. I still love them. So we could say, but Cyril, it's a lot to learn. Oh. The good thing is that the more you learn one, the more you already are you're already learning another. They overlap a lot. So that's the good news. OK, so all this is very abstract, so we need examples. Example, please. You can, you can make noise with me. Example, please. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the morning. <laughs> okay. So one example is that domain-driven domain design and functional programming, for instance, taking two different things, they have a lot in common. And to be honest, I first learned about functional programming ideas by learning domain-driven design. Uh -huh. Not obvious, right? So what do they have in common? Let's have a look at the table of content of the blue book, the blue Bible book of domain-driven design from Eric Evans. And we see, oh, value objects. And we see, oh, side effect free functions. Oh, closure of operations. Oh, declarative design. Oh, drawing on established formalisms. Ho, oh, oh, ho, oh. ho. Basically, this means that if we learn one, you learn another for free, or kind of partially at least. So the way I see the, the skills, I want to be in the middle of all these skill sets, because this is where I will have the best, nice style of code in my code. So domain driven design and functional programming, for instance, it's a love story. Ooh, still kind of abstract, right? Can you use that for tomorrow? No. Okay, we need more examples. Example, please. <coughs> oh, it's better, yeah. <laughs> so one example is monoids. And so monoids, it's, of course, it's something in Doctor Who. So in French, we don't know Doctor Who. It's this kind of creature with only one eye. That's a monoid, all right? But this is not what I want to talk to you right now. I want to talk to you about monoids as, uh, as something we can use in our code. So monoids are a mathematical structure. And so it's a set. And as a programmer, we can define a set the way we want. It's just the, the criteria to decide if something belongs to the set or if it doesn't. So for instance, I will decide that I will create the, define the, I will define the set of every glass of beer with a hole this size where I can put some beer inside. All right, it's kind of definition. Does it belong to the set? Yes. Does it belong to the set? Yes. Does this belong to the set? No. Things don't, some things don't belong in the set. And does it, belong, does it belong to the set? Yeah. So I have a set of things inside and things outside. 
And now I, I, I define something more. I define an operation that I will call something like combine or merge or append or add or whatever I like. And this operation takes two elements and combine them like this. Kind of obvious, right? My kids by the age of two tend to get that right in my experience. And so we have this operation and it combines things and there's something more. If I take an element from the set and another element from the set and if I combine them together, the result is in the set. Yeah, maximum noise. <laughs> Whoa. Actually, it sounds like nothing, but it's everything. And so we have the set, the operation. The operation, we say it's closed under the set. Everything that comes from the set ends up still in the set. That's a very interesting property. And we are still not done. If I take three elements like this in some order, and I, I pay attention to the order. And now if I combine them, these two first and then this one, I end up with this. Now, preserving the order, if I first combine these two together and then this one, I have the same thing. <laughs> no, that's, <laughs> that, that's something. Actually, this means I can put the parentheses anywhere and I still have the same thing. The ordering of the assembly, not the ordering of the thing, the ordering of the assembly doesn't matter. That's a very interesting property we call associativity. And we are almost done. There's one more thing. I will define a special element, a special glass of beer. It's an invisible one. But I do, as a developer, I'm like God. I create the, way, the things the way I want them to be. And so I decide that there is a special glass of beer with a hole the right size. It's invisible. You can put zero beer inside, but it's a special case of zero, right? Or of some beer, right? And whenever I combine this special glass of beer with any other, I end up with the, the same thing, the glass itself. And I call this special glass of beer the neutral element. And it belongs to my set because it, it matches the criteria, right? All these things together, congratulations, we just defined a monoid. A monoid is a structure, so it's a set, an operation, and these three properties, the closure, the closure of operation, everything still in the set, I socially really, and the neutral element that doesn't change anything when I combine, combine it with any other element. All right, so at this point, you may be like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, <laughs> what's this abstract nonsense? <laughs> so when I explained that to my wife uh, long ago, she understood everything and, said, she said, and then she said, so what, well, what for? You may be like that right now. Uh, you know the joke, there's a joke in programming, actually I think it's a joke I first heard from Sandro, that there are only three numbers in programming. Zero, one, and many. You know it? And I believe that monoids, the beauty of monoids is that they encapsulate all these three special cases that you would have to, take to, to handle one by one back into one single structure. Which means that, and this structure is the monoid itself. The neutral element deals with the absence. The regular elements, my glasses of beer, the each deals with the singular. And the, the operation, closed under the set, deals with the plural. So I have a structure that deals with nothing, singular and plural, all together as one systematic case. That's beautiful. Which means it's a strategy to, uh, to encapsulate special cases and ma make your problem simple again. So basically, that's a very important tool we, in our battle against complexity. And we can do that once, and a second time, and a third time. Imagine you have different concepts in our software, and each can be present, absent, many times, one time, again and again. If you, are, if you don't pay attention to that, you end up, in the worst case, with the Cartesian product of every possibility. Here, you, are, you already have something like nine. <coughs> Uh, no, <laughs> more than that, 27 cases of possible combinations. And if you, now if you turn each of them into its own monoid, you fold them back into one case, time one case, time one case. Where? You see, now I have only one case. My software doesn't explode. My complexity, my code complexity remains under control. So if we apply that regularly and often, 
we have a scalable process, scalable in complexity. If you've done TDD, you already realize that TDD is also a scalable process for complexity. It can grow, there is no limit with all the tests you have, all the refactoring you do, you do, you can change anything. It can grow to very complex code and you are still on top of it. This technique is another one to just for the same purpose. So we are scalable in complexity with monoids. So in fact, you may recognize something there. If you are good in object-oriented design, you may find, find out that you are already doing something similar in using object-oriented patterns. Like using the null object, if you have a given interface, you would have special implementation for the null object, the null object pattern, it's not null, null object. You have your implementation, one or many, but for the, the singular. And when you, want, when you want to do, when you want to do some, to deal with plural, with composite things, you use the composite patterns, and the very essence of the composite pattern is to have the plural and the singular behave the same way under the exact same interface so that your color code doesn't care. So here, your color code doesn't care if it's nothing, something, many things. We already do that using these object-oriented patterns. So it's not monoid, but that's the same idea, same goal. Null object for identity, like something like a calculation doing nothing or something like that. All right, so it's still kind of abstract. So we need more examples. Example, please! <coughs> so you know a lot of examples of monoids in your daily work. Numbers, integers, like integers plus integers are still integers. And of course, you can put the parentheses anywhere, still the same result. And of course, so here, integers with addition is one monoid. And the neutral element is zero, because adding zero gives you the same thing. Of course, monoids are, uh, integers are also monoids with the multiplication and the neutral element, one. Wow, it's, a <laughs> it's hard. Uh, lists are common monoids that we, uh, that we, that we use ev all the time. If we, pattern, if we consider the append operation, something like append, concatenating list together, it still works, parentheses anywhere, and the empty list is your, ne is your neutral element. And of course, strings, being just list of characters, harmonize too with the concatenation operation and the empty list as the neutral element. All this is very simplistic, but there's one thing that, very, that is very important in software is we should pay attention to the small things. This is the small things that compound massively. All right, so by the way, this is our lifesaver if we go into very large spaces like everything you do with MapReduce, because this means for MapReduce, you need associativity because your, your work will be partitioned kind of arbitrarily, and they have to be recombined in a way that still gives you the right result. So you need associativity. And using, if you, do, if you model your, your data as a monoid and uh, with some combined operation, you can do that infinitely, scaling infinitely in space this time across many, many nodes, massively parallel map, re map reduces and, and these kind of things. And you can also do it over time. If you computed everything until last hour and you want to get the latest updates, you reuse the result there and you combine it with the last one and again and again and again and you get your real time streaming by combining the monoid again and again and again and again over time continuously in a streaming fashion. So basically, monoids are the key to everything, space and time, big data. And to be honest, there was a joke in big data that was saying that things like, if you are doing big data and you don't know anything about abelian groups, which are a kind of special monoids, and monoid plus plus, then you do it wrong. So just to give you an idea. <coughs> All right, so, but the most important part of monoids for us in practice is that they are composable. It's all about composability. We take, we take things and we combine them together and combine them. Combining is just composing things together. Functions, of course, with composition are another monoid, of course. So we have abstraction in the small that compose at, in the large. In fact, you are very familiar with everything monoid. Every time you do a reduce or a group by in SQL, these are probably a monoid. There, there is almost surely a monoid inside your group by. There is almost surely a monoid inside your, group, your reduce function. But another thing I like about monoids is that we have monoids all over the place in business domains. 
probably because if kids can master monoids by the, the, by the age of two, so do businesses. So monoids are all over the place. And also, it's very good taste to have this kind of code because very, very a lot of benefits, as I will show later. So now for a demonstration. Monoids are something typical in functional programming. Haskell, for instance, is full of monoids. Always, all, uh, everywhere. And in functional programming, everything is a value, all right? Therefore, as a proof, monoids are values. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's sloppy. <laughs> okay, it's sloppy. I, I was, it was supposed to be funny, but I don't see anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. <coughs> but for, for real, monoids have to be value objects in the DDD sense, which means they have to be immutable. So value object is a concept from domain driven design. They have to be immutable, and their equality is by value. A red apple is, if it's red and red, is the same thing, and et cetera. You compare the equality is having all the fields equal one by one. And by the way, we could say that the value object patterns in DDD is just a kind of retro port of functional programming IDs back into your Java or C Sharp, because we have to do that manually. So monoid objects, as value objects, are not anemic. They have behavior. And basically, the combined operation is already some behavior. If I have a length and another one, and I sum them up, I end up with a new length. The plus is, is behavior inside my object, inside my, my Java or C Sharp code, for instance. In practice, this being immutable and doing, it that, doing that in Java means that we have to return a new instance each time. So of course, GC is working well for that. But don't pay, no problem, no problem. GC is okay for us. You always, you always return a new value on the add operation. The other thing is that for this to work well, you have to have absolutely zero side effect. So no, not going to the file, not going to the, to the network, not calling a remote service, nothing like that. Just depend on yourself and that's it. And by the way, these are usually things you should do, you should try to do always, most, most of the time, because it's a very good style in general. Some call, um, I used to have to find that some call it the functional first style, trying to make your code all functional by default, and only then you, sometimes you, you derogate. I try to do that almost 90% 90, 90, 90 of the time. Okay, all right, so concrete examples of monod start with the good old money class and money pattern from Martin Fowler, uh, which basically goes like this. A uh, quantity of money plus another one gives me the total of them. Very simple thing. And of course, once you do that in objects, this, this add operation is the right place to check for inconsistent units. And basically, you end up with something like this. So money like this is just a special case of the quantity pattern also by Martin Fowler. Anyone familiar with this? Analysis Patterns by Martin Fowler is an important book. I really suggest that you have a look. <coughs> you will learn so much inside. So now we have money, and if we add a date, we make, we make it into a payment or a cash flow. And now we can write things like cash flow plus cash flow equals cash flow. And again, we can check that we are not adding payments on different dates. So. To be honest, in, uh, throwing an exception makes it not a monoid anymore in the purest sense. But in this case, if, if I have to throw the exception, this means I have a bug. So assuming I'm bug-free, bug it should never happen, and I'm a monoid for practical uses. So I have my cash flow now, and you can see that this cash flow class is cash flow. It takes cash flow as an argument, as a parameter, and returns cash flow. Cash flow everywhere. It's kind of very selfish, self-centered class. And that's a good thing. That's what we call closure of operation. And you recognize the closure of the monoids. Make sense? <coughs> so closure of operation, I first heard in the DDD book again. Eric Evans wrote that in 2003 in the blue book. So now we have our payments. And if we put payments over time, we end up with sequences of cash flows that we write like this, we sketch them like this. Your business people sketch them like this. And in our Java or C Sharp code, we run it the exact same way, liter literally. Cash flow sequence plus another one gives me another one. 
So what are we trying to do right now? We are just trying to create our own arithmetics of objects. Before I knew about the word monoid, to be honest, I was just saying to my colleagues, and you could do like that as well, don't, don't frighten them then with monoids. You could just say, let's create a little arithmetic of objects that works as beautifully as the arithmetic of numbers. And I love that. That's <laughs> and the, the other good thing is that this is the way your business people are thinking. That's the way they are sketching. And that's the way we want it to be in our code directly. All right? So with some experience in monoids, the more you think about them, the more you see them everywhere. Monoids, monoids everywhere. <coughs> you, if you think about ranges, like intervals, you can define union of intervals, and you define it the way that fits your business. Here it's a kind of loose definition. It kind of work, but I have to define of course, the special element of the empty range, the range with nothing inside. And by the way, you can hack it as long as people using your code don't have to go inside. You, you may use a hack like using infinity of integers or doubles or using a, a, a hidden Boolean inside or whatever. I don't care. You can hack inside, but it should not show in your interface. And then you're okay. So if you do that, you are thinking about monoid, but you should not talk about monoids with other people, of course. Which means if you go, if you are working in, in the hotel booking business, you have the range and the range, and it's a monoid, but you would go to the business people and say, would it make sense if we would say that uh, an hotel booking from this day to this day plus another one would be equivalent to this? And they would most likely say yes. And you inter internally, you know, hey, I got my monoid. Okay? You don't have to say the, the M word. So by the way, the implementation here would be something like this. Take the mean of the mean, the max of the max, and we are done. So you see the promise, very simple code? We are it. Predicates are monoids, very obvious monoids too, and many times. Filter and filter, predicate and predicate with the end operation, they are a monoid, and the neutral element would be the predicate returning always true. And the same thing for or, and the predicate, the neutral element predicate would be the one returning always false. Monoids sometimes are hidden in places you don't, you would not expect, like grants, you know, access rights. Read, write, execute. If you define your plus operation as the most secure wins, you end up with this kind of relationships. And in code, in Java code, I, I would do, I would use that, I would do that using an enum, ordered by most secured, and the implementation would be as simple as a mean with the, the rank of your constant in your enum. Okay? So, so far we've seen rather small-ish monoids, but they can grow bigger and bigger and bigger using a lot of memory. You know, in many, in many applications you need preferences. And typically, you have some hard-coded preferences. So these are typically key value maps. You need some hard-coded preferences, and then you have the one from the property files, and then the one for region by region, and then the one for the department, and then maybe some overriding at the user level. Sounds familiar? And, <coughs> and you have a precedence relationship between them. The last one wins, or something like this. It can be made into something like monoid again, defining some kind of merge operation. So you, you, load, you get one and you apply the other one on top and the next and the next and the next. And your plus implementation will just delegate for each key, will delegate the actual combi combining to the values. That's funny. This means that I am actually delegating, I actually have monoids the map is a monoid, and the values are monoids too, each of them having its own specific combine operation, which means basically that I'm, I'm nesting monoids inside monoids, and again, and again, and again. To be honest, it was also true for the cash flow sequence. The cash flow sequence is a sequence and merges just the sequence part of it and delegates to the money the job of merging the monies together. 
So it's very common to do that. And the neutral element can be just the map with all the, the neutral elements are, as values or just the empty map. So map, map with the put all is naturally a monoid. Okay, so even big things like DOM or big object trees can be monoid-ish and it's very interesting to do that because then you have the convenience of, of all these arithmetics of monoids. So very simple thing indeed. The hardest thing probably is just to realize, to accept that it can be that simple. So monoids, monoids, all the things. Now if we are convinced we want to, to, we want to see the full world as monoids. <sighs> Unfortunately, there are some stuff that resists, like everything nonlinear, average, standard deviations, K clustering thing, Barry centers. You cannot do things like average plus average because it would be just wrong. Average is not composable. Obvious, right? <laughs> I would so much love that to make that into a monoid. <laughs> Actually, we can. Yeah. What is an average? An average is the sum of the values over the number of the values. So I cannot sum the average directly, but if I take the intermediate elements, they compose, which means that if I take my problem, look back a little bit, turn it into a tuple, then I can make my average into a composable form just by accepting to have it not just as a value, but as a tuple, okay? And I can do it again. If I need standard deviations, I can do the same trick. You just need to keep the sum of the square values, and there's a special relationship at the end. Typically, in a MapReduce, you would do all the MapReduce in this form, and at the very, very end, you just take the standard deviation out of this tuple, or triple. Which means I can model monoid even, I can, I can even make, make nonlinear stuff as a monoid if I want to. And he's quoting DDD Borat, is great success. All right, so once we are there, we can do that again and again and expand beyond monoids into other mathematical creatures. We can be, we've seen that we can be monoid several times. Here I'm monoid with union and, and nobody, or intersection and everybody. Um, and we can go further. We can go into this weird world of vector space. But actually, it just means that we have a scaling operation. Money loves, money is usually in this case, you can add pieces of money, but you can also uh, add half of it or some fraction of it. And in code, it's just a matter of a second operation taking some coefficient that, is, that, that will kind of modulate your value. So why, 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 it, why all this thing is useful? It's useful because that's the way we think in the real world. I really want, I really, people are really drawing this kind of sketches on the napkins. And we want it literally in the inner code, as I said. And yeah, that's declarative code, that's kind of clean code. And it's also something, it's declarative. And this declarative code, this declarative style of code is a very nice property of the code. It means that your code is itself its own documentation, mostly. It reflects the, what you understood from the domain. As we've seen as well, monoid is just a type and an operation. You can't beat that. Talking about simplicity, you just can't beat that. Two things, you just write one operation. So you have much less code and much less bugs compared to what your, maybe your colleagues are doing right now. If I take this, this cash flow over time example again, if we work in mobile price plans, for instance, telecom price plans, you may have the monthly fee for, for your price plan. You may have some annual, don't know, insurance payment. You maybe have the, you bought the, the, the phone at the beginning. And depending on the things that you have and that you don't have, you may want to compute the actual payments that you want to invoice. And I don't know about you, but in my life, I see a lot of people doing this randomly. Like, when you have this and that, I will write a special for loop for it. When you have this and this, I would do like this. Whereas, 
the most, the most powerful way to factor this problem out will be to have the free generators of payments. And then, and then you expose that as an API to your colleagues, and then they can do on the job, they can combine what they really need. And so this would be the API for, for your fellow developers. <coughs> so being immutable and without side effects, monoids are just extremely simple to test. You just put values in and you get values out and that's it, always the same thing, extremely easy to test. And only one operation to learn, only one type to learn is also not, it's also a very reduced cognitive load for, for everyone around you. So I love this example again and again. So beyond monoids, you can also, you could, if you like, you could explore Wikipedia and find out other, uh, other structures like cyclic groups and all these things. And actually, the names are always extremely horrible. But the, what it is actually at the root is extremely simple each time. And each time, whenever you do something coming from mathematics, you get a second effect for free is that it's already very, very well documented and it's already proof, proven not to have any corner case. It, you have theorems proving that it will always be right. It will always be okay. You are in the most idealistic kind of situation for, for, for your problem. And this idea is that, or again, Eric Evans wrote about it in 2003, is that by drawing on established formalism, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. The wheel. You can just reuse proven systems of thinking, systems of thought, and, you, and use them in your code, uh, just like monoids, just like we've seen with monoids uh, so far. So in practice, you may want to tell your colleagues that you did that on purpose. And for instance, uh, I could create some custom annotation like monoid, I would pull it on the operation for this monoid and saying, by so this operation works with the neutral element that is this empty list member. And if I do that, just by putting this extra thing in my code, I make my intention visible for everyone in the team. And that's an example of a living documentation. I had to mention it because I wrote a book about it. <laughs> <coughs> Okay, you get the picture? No, okay, there's a proof. <laughs> so we want to, one thing is that mathematics are talking mathematics jargon and our domains, our business domains are not using the mathematical jargons usually. So we have to dress the mass up to look like or to sound like the words you actually use in your domains. If I take this mailing list example, the operation is called intersection. That's the word from the mathematics. And empty list is more is a word for, for from developers. Is, this is not the way people talk about this problem. They talk about overlapping mailing lists, maybe. They talk about the list with nobody inside. And our job is to kind of alias the mathematical jargon into the equivalent domain specific names. All right, that's clean code, hein, by the way. That's just clean code 101, very important, but extremely useful. And if we do that, you are very happy, everything's fine, and yeah, smile. All right, so in closing, after all this, first buy my book. <laughs> it's on in pub. Uh, you can get it for free, honestly. You, take the, you put the price to zero, you get it, or if you want to pay, you can pay too. And it will be on. Um, it, we, it will be la It will be on Addison Wesley soon. We are working hard with the publishers to get it out uh, before the end of the year. It's already on Amazon, so you can also uh, buy it. So it's not about monoids. It's a book on living documentation: how to make sure what you meant can be understood by your colleagues without writing prose. Yeah, most importantly, because we don't like to write prose, right? <laughs> So monoids, basically, back to monoids. Monoids, the key idea is all about composability. Composability, that's the most important idea. Composability is the key, and monoids are the essence of extreme composability. Um, it's worthwhile investing time in learning whatever, actually, but especially domain-driven design, functional programming, object-oriented patterns. And when you get better at one, you are already learning another. 
So that's very interesting as, a, as an investment strategy. That's the way you think about your career, right? And your knowledge. And there are some paradox like this, like FP. By learning through FP, in turn, you can develop a better taste writing object-oriented code in Java or C Sharp or TypeScript. But the biggest obstacle to this idea is that they, are, they look extremely simple. And you know simplicity doesn't mean easy. And most of your colleagues probably don't have any appreciation for simple things. Prob many of them appreciate or favor complex stuff. Oh, I'm the war, I'm the, I'm the god of using memcached, or this kind of, and the more, the more complexity, the better for most people. So the biggest obstacle is just in, in the mindset by trying to turn your team, to switch the team, appreciating simple things. Simple things are better. It doesn't come as a, as a given. You have to promote this idea. And once you're there, you are done because monoids are easy and you should eat them. They are good. Eat them, eat them, eat them. Look for monoids everywhere in your domains. You may also have a look at other mathematical structures from Wikipedia, whatever. And so I haven't talked much about the TDD in this, in this thing. But in TDD, uh, how, do we do, how do we do monoids using TDD? First we, still, first, we have to dream of using the monoids. And you know, in TDD, we start with creating the ideal API that we would like to use. If it, if it was done, how would it look like if it was done already? And this is the time you, that's the best time to introduce this idea of monoids by just writing an assertion, something like this type is the result of combining this type to this type and the three types are of the same type. That's basically what it means. Most of the, half of the monoid is just that, the closure of operation. And you can also, of course, you can also do it afterward because you don't realize, you don't necessarily realize you have a monoid early on. Imagine you have this code. It is, it is it's probably not written, com not named combined, but something like this. T combined with U gives you a V. And in, at, at refactoring time, you realize that T, U, and V are not that different. Maybe they could be folded back into one type. And you do it, and then you probably already have your monoid ready. You, just, you, you can just expand and add your neutral element. It's good practice, but you don't necessarily need it. So you may not need a full monoid. But the closure of operation is the central ID in this. And by the way, it doesn't violate the Demeter law. It's typically monoid, you use them many times. Dot, 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 and Typically, you may have learned that it's not good practice to do dot, 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 dot. But it's, it is good practice if it's t, dot, t, dot, t, dot, t. If you are always on the same type, it's okay. Demeter is okay. Okay, so one thing, software craft as a, as a, as a set of skills is expanding. We should not always look at the past all the time and stay to the same fixed set of practices. For instance, right now, uh, we should embrace, in 2018, we should embrace things like property-based testing. And for monoids, property-based testing is fantastic because monoids, by definition, is free properties. The closure is taken care of by the compiler, the same type. And the two other, we can test them using properties. So for instance, using a JUnit quick check, you would decorate your test with runways, Right, the test cases would be decorated with property. You would ask the, the framework to inject your values, random values, using this kind of annotation. And then your properties would be described like this. The neutral element means that whenever I combine it, at the left or at the right, I end up with the same thing. That's all. That's, that's what it means to have a neutral element. So actually, this one you can copy paste, or maybe you can do something smarter. Uh, <laughs> I let it to you as an exercise. And associativity just means that combining this one and then this one, or combining this one with the two already combined, same thing, and that's it. Okay? So, in real closing, functional programming is beautiful. La, 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 la. It's a matter of taste-driven development, not just taste-driven development, so that your code doesn't end up like this. Thank you very much, and if you want to go further, 
I put online a paper, it's a 17 page paper, kind of deep paper, uh, that, you, that I will advertise shortly, but you can already access using this link. And thank you very much.